With your host, Andrew Donaldson, this is Heard Tell. Uh, welcome back to Heard Tell. Let's go back to the environment and climate issues. Kelsey Grant, another one of our great young voices contributors that we love to have on and to work with. Kelsey, how are you today? I'm doing great. Happy to be here. How are you doing? I'm fantastic. Okay. You are in environmental issues. You talk a lot about energy. You write about energy and the environment and climate, but your day job, you actually work with oil and gas companies. So just as a way of introducing yourself and having us a baseline here, what is it you do with oil and gas companies? Yeah. So I technically work in the oil and gas consulting world. Um, In a nutshell, I try to help oil and gas companies be the best that they can be. More specifically, we support oil and gas companies in being ESG aligned in creating decarbonization strategies and stakeholder engagement and responding to a world with rising social risks. Let's just start right there, though. People hear, okay, oil and gas, they kind of got an idea in their head what that is. Why in the world would that have social risk to it? Social risk, um, in my definition, means combined policy, political, and community factors that could delay an oil and gas project. And so you might think, well, where does the social risk really uh, derive from? So as we know, fossil fuels have played an incredible role in supporting human development and giving us the standard of living that we have today. On the flip side, there's also a real cost to using fossil fuels, and that cost comes from the emissions that result from burning fossil fuels. And uh, emissions have a real impact on our climate. And in the last several years or really decades, the public has been awakened to the potential effects of these emissions and climate change. And so that has really contributed to an increasingly hostile regulatory, political, and policy environment for uh, oil and gas. Okay, so let's just take the list you just mentioned. You got communities, you got companies, you got governments. Uh, We need good policy for all those, but isn't part of the problem right now that all three of those groups are more adversarial and in competition with each other about the policies instead of working together and trying to discuss them out? Exactly. I think that's one of the key issues and reasons why we've seen so little progress on the climate issue, um, because it is so divisive, it is partisan. You have groups that should be working together and pulling from one another's strengths uh, to address the problem, but rather there are uh, competing objectives and goals that um, I think are stagnating progress more than anything. Yeah, talking to Kelsey Grant, um, you let off when you wrote about this in Real Clear Energy, a piece we recommend everybody go read. We're gonna link it in all the show notes. Uh, You let off with just about exactly that when you said part of the problem here is everybody just wants to bash the ideas, but there doesn't seem to be a lot of productive counter ideas coming back. And that's where you actually develop policy and stuff. And therefore, everybody just kind of falls back on what they were already saying. And it becomes more ramparts than meeting in the middle, don't it? People like to criticize what other people think. Um, And it's entirely unhelpful. Um, And it's only going to be able to do so much in helping us to address the problem and to uh, um, accelerate the energy transition in a responsible way. Now, we have a real world example of this. Uh, We know the Build Back Better uh, agenda was this monstrosity package. We know it's pretty much dead as far as dead goes for the moment, Um, depending on how you feel about Joe Biden and Joe Manchin. The two Joes on that front will probably be depending how you think about that whole package. But it is unmistakable that one of the real breaking points of this legislation was all the environmental stuff on it. Uh, The Democrats and the left really, really wanted that environmental stuff. The right and the Republicans were really dug in that they weren't going to have any of it. Why was that such a contentious part of this legislation? Yeah. So, first of all, the whole reconciliation bill was pretty divisive. Um, But let's say just if we focus just on the environmental part, it's not surprising Uh, because the reconciliation process is a partisan process. You only need 50 votes or majority votes, excuse me, um, to pass the bill. Democrats don't need to cater to Republicans and their concerns and their priorities to pass a 
uh, spending bill. So I don't really blame Republicans for not leaning into the, the reconciliation bill because it didn't feel like one that was their own. They had very little leverage. With that said, um, the reconciliation process was still an opportunity for, I think, our Republican and conservative leaders to showcase uh, good, effective market-based solutions. Um, we didn't see that really happening. Um, so in my view, I think reconciliation was a missed opportunity for Republicans. And leading forward, I think we should uh, reconsider how the Republican Party can lead on climate and energy policy. And you mentioned it in your piece. One of the reasons that you think they should do something like reconciliation or at least some kind of a negotiation process is that you pointed out the only thing worse than just denouncing everything is when you denounce everything and you don't actually bring any idea of your own. And you see that to be a real trap for the Republicans and the conservatives here of, well, yeah, you're denouncing, 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 and that polls well with your base, but you're not actually ever proposing anything and it's going to just become one note at some point, isn't it? Exactly. So this goes back to what leadership actually means. And leadership goes beyond criticizing and putting down ideas that you don't like. Leadership means that you're going to propose ideas that are much better um, than the alternatives. And one of these alternatives is something uh, the term might make some people recoil. So we're going to go nice and slow, use a small term here, carbon pricing. Now, everybody just calm down. I know some of our conservative and libertarian friends are probably going to recoil because carbon has kind of become almost a bad buzzword when we talk about these things. So just explain it, though. What do you mean by carbon pricing? Great. Um, first, I, I, I'm, I'm happy you mentioned that. And I'm just going to encourage anybody in the audience um, who is listening to reclaim these words and to think of them through a new conservative or libertarian uh, perspective. Um, so also to clarify, so carbon pricing is a broad term. Carbon pricing could mean cap and trade. Carbon pricing can also mean a carbon fee. In the context of our, our conversation, I'm referring to a carbon fee, also known as a carbon tax. I know unfortunate buzzword there. Um, so at a basic level, and or at least something really important to know about a carbon fee is that it's an incredibly flexible policy and you can shape it really however you want. And in my opinion, um, some versions of a carbon fee or carbon tax are better than others. But at the most basic and fundamental level, what a carbon fee is, is it places a price on energy relative to its emissions. So over time, consumers will be encouraged to purchase cheaper, low carbon energy. Uh, that can be natural gas, that can be nuclear, hydro, solar, wind, and then discouraged from purchasing uh, more carbon intensive energy that's more expensive like coal. Um, a carbon tax is also pretty essential to creating a, an, an economic environment that will support the development of other technologies that will be quite central to reducing our emissions like carbon capture. And even better, it enjoys the support of the business community, energy companies, and uh, conservatives, at least certain conservatives. Yeah, certain conservatives. We're going to let all those oh. conservatives and libertarian friends take a minute, let them breathe, let them absorb all that. Uh, we're going to take a break and come back more with Kelsey Grant. We're going to break down the carbon pricing model, what that actually means, what it doesn't mean, because there's some connotations to that. Some very surprising uh, hardcore conservative figures of note who actually are OK with this, just in case you need to ease into the subject a little bit. More with Kelsey Grant right after this on her tell. <laughs> to her tell we're continuing to talk to kelsey grant talking a little bit of climate and environmental policy especially when it comes to fossil fuels and we broached the c word carbon 
Uh, it had, like we said, it has a lot of connotation, especially in conservative circles. If you grew up on conservative talk radio, hearing about carbon offsets and carbon taxes and all that, that's kind of a boogeyman for a lot of people. But as you argue in your writing and your advocacy, this is something that it's an evolving idea and the way people thought about it 10, 15, 20 years ago, maybe they need to re-examine it, don't they? Absolutely. So uh, going back several uh, decades, uh, uh, George H.W. Uh, Bush was uh, responsible for implementing a cap and trade program that helped to reduce sulfur dioxide and to address acid rain. Um, uh, Ronald Reagan was responsible for helping to support the negotiation the Montreal Protocol. Richard Nixon founded the EPA and really supported the Clean Air and Water Acts. So there really is a rich conservative and Republican legacy in environmental stewardship and conservation. And so it's what I'm basically encouraging um, conservatives who are a little bit more skeptical of those words carbon and climate to just return uh, back to our roots and our legacy. Yeah, and of course, George H.W. Bush was an oil guy by trade. That's how he made his fortune after World War II. So he was a little bit of an expert on the field. Um, Doesn't this go to what you were talking about before? about if you don't have a good if you don't have a good idea you can't just say bad ideas because what happens here is just take that term carbon conservatives have kind of lost mastery over what that term means and it means all these other things now like you said isn't this just a perfect example of if you don't stay in the fight on certain things it's going to go to the other side and then you just kind of get lost when you try to come back to it Exactly. So to use a very cliche phrase, if you aren't at the table, you're on the menu. I think conservatives should reinvent their client playbook um, away from being on the defense and going on to the offense. So it's quite common in conservative and Republican circles to rely on criticizing progressive policies. We kind of saw some reconciliation to an extent it was understandable given the partisan process of reconciliation but we see in other spaces too. So the majority of Republicans in Congress will be able to, would be very quick to denounce, say, for example, the Green New Deal, dismiss it as a a socialist uh, Trojan horse, but a fewer number would be able to say what the alternative to the Green New Deal should be. And that's a problem, Um, especially when there are fiscally conservative and market-based solutions um, that uh, is just waiting for uh, Republican support. And it's important to acknowledge, um, there's, important, there's an important caveat to me saying uh, Republicans often rely on critiquing progressives. And that's this point. In recent years, Republicans have made huge strides in the right direction on climate change. And I would be wrong to discount that and to not give credit where credit is due. So for example, John Curtis in Utah, I believe last year he founded the Conservative Climate Caucus. Um, Senator Braun in Indiana, he really pioneered the Growing Climate Solutions Act, which really empowers farmers in the ag community to partake in our climate solutions. You know, Senator Cassidy in Louisiana, which has been a very vocal support of uh, carbon capture and sequestration technology development in his state. And the list does go on. It doesn't go as, uh, on for as long as it should, but there really have been Republican leaders popping up in the last few years, showing what it looks like for the party to lead on this issue rather than following Democrats on it. Is part of this a terminology problem? Because I, I've kind of gotten to the point studying this stuff where I'm just I'm very content to just say I don't know about a lot of the climate change stuff. I'm skeptical of the you know, the world's going to end in five years. You know, you can miss me with all that nonsense. Is there a problem with pollution and stuff? Well, we know that how much of it's man-made, how much of it's natural. But my thing is, I do care about conservation. I do care about, you know, the environment on that level. I grew up out in the woods. I would like everybody to have that opportunity. I grew up in West Virginia, which is, you know, pretty pristine as far as natural beauty goes compared to a lot of places. I like those places being preserved. Is some of it just nomenclature and terminology of like, hey, we need, if you care about conservation, And if you're more of a conservative person and you have the concepts of stewardship already kind of ingrained in you, you need to be in these conversations because then you are the voice that's blunting some of that more radical, crazy stuff. Yeah. So there is a serious language problem when we talk about climate change. So obviously, climate change is seen as a progressive issue. 
And typically the only language we can recall when we think about climate, it's typically through progressive terms. Um, and those terms are fine. They relate to a certain subset of the population, but when conservatives are trying to engage in the climate discussion, they really can might struggle in relating to the problem. So if you hear me talk about climate change, you're not going to hear me talking um, probably about down with capitalism, that we need to destroy capitalism to address climate change. You might not hear me talking about justice as much. What you'll probably hear me talking about is, like you said, stewardship. I'm a deeply religious person. I will tie it back to uh, my faith and creation care, stewarding what is good. And so that's the kind of language that resonates with me. And conservatives have this language, and you articulate it very well, that you care about conservation. Um, but we just need more Republican proud voices using that language to discuss climate change. Now, to be fair to the conservatives that uh, kind of recoiled some of this stuff, you you said what has usually been a taboo topic in the past, but when you start saying the word tax and carbon tax and pricing and things like that, they naturally recoil and go, well, that's going to drive up costs. That gets government intervention. What's the retort to that? What's the explainer to that to try to get folks that, you know, usually raising taxes is a non-starter with a lot of those folks on any reason, but obviously we have to have some taxes for some things. Why would this be a good place for that? Yeah, so this is a timely question uh, in light of where energy and gasoline prices are right now. And so it's important to acknowledge that on, on its own, a carbon tax is regressive on its own. But going back to an original point that I've made is that a carbon tax is an incredibly flexible policy and you can design it however you want. And I didn't address this in my article because you only have so many words that you can uh, have in an, in an opinion piece but there's actually a, a version of a carbon tax that addresses exactly that problem you brought up about energy prices. So you can actually, there is, there's, a, there's actually a, a Republican climate platform that's actually structured around um, this kind of proposal. But what you can do is in addition to a carbon tax, you can pair it with what is called a carbon dividend. And so what that is, it's a monthly rebate back to American households. So the government will take all the money that is generated uh, from a carbon tax minus a very, very small administrative fee, and they will dividend it back to every single American household. And what that does is it not only offsets the rising energy costs, for a majority of Americans, they would be left even more whole than they were before. And so it insulates them from these rising energy and gasoline prices. And you know what's even better is with that rebate or dividend, whatever you wanna call it, each American is empowered and allowed to do whatever they want with it. They can use it to invest in their call their child's college education. They can use it to buy a gun. They can use it to buy an electric vehicle. They can use it to put solar panels on the roof. They can do whatever they want with it. But at the end of the day, it would insulate them and protect them from rising energy costs that a lot of people should and already are deeply concerned about. So you wrote this piece uh, before uh, the events in Ukraine. Russia invades them. Uh, obviously huge geopolitical ramification, huge energy and environmental and climate implications because of the uh, gas and natural gas pipelines that go through Ukraine to get to Europe. What's changed since then as far as the policies go? Because you're talking about things like carbon offsets, you talk about border policies. What's changed because of what Russia did? Yeah. So in my article, I discussed what was called or is called a border carbon adjustment. And I cite, a, I think, a fantastic article written by Senator uh, Kramer, a Republican senator, on the topic of a border carbon adjustment and Russia. And so before I talk about what has changed since, since the invasion, I think I'll just list a, a few things or the, a few um, benefits and advantages to border carbon adjustment. And to take a step back, what a border carbon adjustment uh, mechanism is, is it's a fee applied at the border. So there's a, a fee that is tacked onto carbon intensive goods coming into the United States or the country that has in, uh, applied a border carbon adjustment. And moving forward, I'll also refer to it as a BCA for short. Um, so first, a border carbon adjustment is a way for the United States to capitalize on its already very carbon efficient processes at home, giving it an instant competitive advantage in um, the global markets against trading partners that are less carbon efficient at home. Second, it allows the United States to set the rules on um, climate policy and energy policy globally, posturing us as a leader rather than a follower um, into the 21st century on energy development and climate. 
And in relation to Russia, which is what the um, Senator Kramer's article really had to uh, do with, is a border carbon adjustment has the potential to undercut Russia's uh, leverage over our energy dependent EU allies. Um, so, you know, Russia's um, oil and gas exports um, make up about 40 to 60 percent of the government's uh, revenue every year. And it's a really key leverage uh, leverage tool, in the United States. And in addition with uh, in partnership with our EU, EU allies over um, Putin. And so then you asked, you know, what has changed since uh, Putin has invaded Ukraine? And so my opinions on a border carbon adjustment hasn't changed uh, necessarily. Um, I think it's a good policy for the reasons that I just mentioned. However, there's something, something that I've really gotten out of the uh, Russian-Ukraine conflict and in terms of how our, our energy markets are, are, are um, operating right now is we should address uh, energy policy with at least a little bit more humility. So what we are seeing with um, the energy transition uh, debate and energy transition narratives that have been unfolding is that people who had um, beliefs about the energy transition um, and climate policy before Russia's invasion of Ukraine, they're basically using the invasion to affirm um, what they had already thought on both sides of the argument. And I really think that's probably an unproductive way for us to carry forward our uh, debates and conversations on energy. I think it's really important for us to step back and to try to be as humble as possible um, moving forward because there are balancing, there are considerations that we have to balance here. One is climate and the other one, and this isn't, these are not the only two, but two major uh, considerations right now is nuclear risk. And so the, the, I think the question I'm really wrestling with right now, I don't have a perfect answer, is how do we pursue smart, responsible energy policy that doesn't uh, increase um, uh, conflict with uh, uh, countries like Russia that are being are somewhat unpredictable, who have put their nuclear weapons on high alert. And so that's my biggest takeaway um, after the invasion is to just proceed very, very cautiously and humbly. And in fact, I think this, going back to the original point of my article, is I think this is where Republicans would be very useful. I think Republicans could help support us in developing a very pragmatic, responsible um, approach to uh, pursue, to a pro approach to decarbonization policy at home and internationally. Is this one of those things where we really do need to lead as a country because there's just no way to extricate ourselves from the wider world. We already know about wider climate concept. You know, people talk about, well, China's doing this and India's doing that and whoever. Is this just another example of why America needs to lead from the front on this so we do have a little bit of control when it comes to things like this? Absolutely. I mean, I, I'm a firm belief that to for a country to lead into, into the 21st century, they're also going to have to lead on climate and energy policy. Um, and it's interesting that you brought up uh, China. I mean, China is one of the, I think, the largest producer of solar modules in the world. And so they're capitalizing on the energy transition. And I would much rather that would be the United States. I'm sure all of us would much rather it would be the United States. And the view of a border carbon adjustment is it levels a playing field between countries like China, which have carbon intensive processes for creating these technologies, and the United States that has less carbon intensive processes for creating these technologies and allows them to compete on a level playing field in the global market. And so it's just one tool to help um, put the United States in the, the driver's seat of energy policy moving further into the century. Yeah, I'm talking to Kelsey Grant, Young Voices contributor, been talking a lot of carbon, that C word, uh, good stuff from you on environmental and energy policy stuff. Let folks know where your social media is, where you're writing and what you got going on so they can continue to follow you. Great. So my Twitter handle is at Grant Kelsey. This particular article we've been talking about is from um, Real Clear Energy. I encourage you to check it out. And you can also find me on LinkedIn. Yep. And she's one of our great young voices contributors that we always enjoy having. So we're looking forward to seeing what she has coming up next. Kelsey Grant, thank you so much for the time today, ma'am. Great. Thank you so much for having me. No problem. Anytime.